Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ugo Simeoni. I work as a research and innovation manager at TTN Global. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the fourth episode of the Flexible Power Generation webinar series organized by the ETN Global uh, in cooperation with um, ATIPSnet, the European Technology and Innovation Platform Smart Networks for Energy Transition, and uh, five Horizon 2020 projects, namely the Flex and Comfu, High Flex Power, Pump Heat, SCO2 Flex, and Turbo Reflex. I would like to welcome our today's speakers, Mr. Alberto Traverso from the University of Genoa, uh, Mr. Justin Ningwei Chu from KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Mr. Stefano Piola from Ansaldo Energia, and Mr. Adrian Reveyer from Siemens Digital. All the speakers today are all part of the Horizon 2020 project Pump Heat. Uh, that stands for Performance and Tapped Modulation for Power and Heat via Energy Accumulation Technologies. So the project has been funded under the uh, Horizon 2020 Coal LCE 28-2017 Highly Flexible and Efficient Fossil Fuel Power Plants with the aim to develop solutions that would allow the integration of fossil fuel power plants in energy system with a higher share of renewables. In fact, with the current growing of, share, uh, of renewable power, uh, especially when having priority access to the grid, fossil fuel power plants will have to increasingly shift their role from providing base load power to providing fluctuating uh, backup power to meet the unpredictable uh, and short notice uh, demand peaks in order to control and stabilize the grid. So in this context, the power plants are required to operate across a wide range of loads uh, with uh, fast startup and shutdowns, while keeping a high efficiency and minimizing the wear of the power plant components. The pump heat concept is uh, has been developed just to address those issues. So applying an innovative CHP technology in combined cycle plants to improve uh, flexibility and efficiency. So the, the pump heat basically demonstrate um, an innovative concept that couples uh, a fast cycling, highly efficient heat pump with combined cycle power plants. So the system features also thermal storage and advanced control concept for smart scheduling. Now, without uh, any further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to give more details and to give a presentation general of the, the project. So um, I would like to leave the stage to um, Mr. Alberto Traverso, project coordinator and chair of the energy system at the University of Genoa. The University of Genoa main tasks beside the uh, coordination of the project is also responsible for the conceptual design of the pump heat and the owner and developer of the high pressure expander. So, um, Alberto, could you please give us a general introduction to the project and please feel free to, to share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo, for your kind introduction. How, I hope you can see my screen. And uh, I'm glad to start this seminar uh, about the Pump It project, where it's already three years we are going to demonstrate now in the field new concepts for augmenting the flexibility of combined cycles through uh, heat pumps and thermal energy storage. So I would like to uh, provide, first of all, an overview of the project as a whole, and then try to answer to you together to two questions. Why heat pumps for uh, flexibility, combined cycle flexibility, and how also use heat pumps for combined cycle flexibility, I introducing two layouts that will be further detailed by my colleagues uh, in the following presentations. And finally, just a, a quick overview of the ongoing demonstration activities and equipment. So let's start from the project. In a nutshell, uh, we can say that uh, we want to integrate, we are studying and demonstrating how to integrate the blue components, which are heat pump and thermal energy storage, with the green components, which are part of a conventional combined cycle. This combined cycle, the green combined cycle, can be both 
only for power, so that's why we talk about power oriented, or can be a cogenerative layout. Cogenerative layout may mean steam or heat. In our case, we are mainly focusing on district heating networks. In this case, specifically the Turing in Torino uh, district heating network, which is run at 120 degrees C. So, in a general, as a general idea, a heat pump, a large size heat pump, we are talking about megawatt size heat pump, can be used as a smart electrical load within uh, the combined cycle fences. The heat pump may also allow the combined cycle to sell grid services also when the system is off. During operation, the heat pump will help the gas turbine to both reducing the minimum power, so the minimum environmental load, but also augmenting maximum power when required. So the flexibility features of the combined cycle are extended. Also, heat pump can produce useful heat for this heating network when available, and very important economic and environmental issue may displace auxiliary boilers. Auxiliary boilers are always present for picking, for picking shaving. Heat pump will also increase the combined cycle average annual efficiency. In case, for instance, uh, the exhaust condensation at the chimney is allowed. So you can run the system condensing water at the exhaust. So why heat pump for, for, for combined cycle flexibility? Because it's an additional component within the plan. Well, first, a market, a market consideration. To store or use excess of renewable production, is, is, we know is mandatory in every energy market and will be more and more mandatory. Heat pumps enable the so-called power to heat approach and potentially also back heat to power. The thermal energy storage allows to use the heat when it's most beneficial to combine cycle profitability and flexibility. So the, the overall idea is uh, try to use the thermal energy storage as an equivalent battery, an equivalent electrical storage. In cogenerative application, as we said, the heat pump may also displace fossil fuel auxiliary boilers. And one interesting observation is that France and Italy are the largest European markets for heat pumps. So these two countries, for instance, uh, can have already an established market that can be very interested to consider the use of heat pumps in combined cycle for power generation. And then uh, after the market consideration, a technical consideration. In the reference paper at the bottom of, the, of my slide, uh, we studied um, several correction curves simulation data and also field data to understand the effect on a wide fleet of gas turbines and combined cycles, in this case I'm talking mainly about combined cycles, the impact of the intake temperature. Because as you might uh, understand, one of the ways to uh, make a synergy between a heat pump and a combined cycle is to condition the intake temperature of the compressor. And we found out that quite consistently, while right hand side is quite obvious that we have a, a, a constant decay of peak power while increasing the temperature and vice versa, decreasing the ambient temperature, the efficiency of the combined cycle has quite a flat area, in particular between 10 degrees C up to 30 or even in some cases 40 degrees C. This flat area means that the efficiency of the combined cycle is quite insensitive to the intake temperature of the compressor. And this could be a very nice degree of freedom to be exploited for off-design performance and minimum environmental load reduction of combined cycles. So I hope I answered why uh, it's interesting to use heat pumps for combined flexibility. Now I'm going to answer in one single slide how heat pumps for combined flexibility can be used, introducing the two layouts. <clears throat> we have basically mainly two layouts. One is the power oriented for combined cycles where power is the main product. So we don't have cogeneration on the left hand side. And so we can think to use 
a set of components, including mainly the heat pump and the cold thermal energy storage, with the heat exchanger at the intake of the compressor. So to condition in higher temperature or lower temperature, depending on the situation, the air temperature at the compressor. As we demonstrated before, having a control, a direct control on, on this temperature can highly enhance the flexibility feature of the whole combined cycle. Furthermore, if you put, a, let's say, air conditioning unit can be in higher temperature or lower temperature, I, I repeat this part, um, can also help, if it is the case, a redesign of the compressor. So basically you can optimize, and this is something we have not actually considered, but it's a future development, you can reconsider the design of the compressor to optimize the flexible operation of the combined cycle considering the presence of this heat exchanger. On the right side, you have a cogenerative uh, situation where in this case we consider uh, feeding heat to a local district heating network. There are multiple layouts which are possible in a cogenerative layout, but the, the one which is presented here is the so-called series configuration where a heat pump is put in series with the return water from the city and provides some delta T, not the full delta T required to feed back the city for the supply pipe, but some delta T that will be supplemented by steam extraction from the combined cycle. This configuration allows the heat pump to be operated synergetically with the combined cycle. Another configuration that will be also uh, later explained is uh, the parallel configuration, where the heat pump in that case uh, needs to provide the whole delta T required by the district heating network. Despite the disadvantage of, uh, in the parallel configuration, of a higher delta T, which means lower coefficient of performance from the heat pump, so lower performance, there is the strategic advantage of having the possibility of operating the heat pump independently from the combined cycle. And so actually using the heat pump as a smart electrical load in for selling grid services. In the two cases, in the power-oriented or the congenerative layouts, of course, the heat pump plus thermal energy storage have different roles. Finally, I would like uh, just to um, outline the demonstration activities which are ongoing. We have uh, three main sites where we are operating validation at lab at industrial scale. The, the left one is the main project demo, which is located in the combined cycle of Torino City, Torino Nord, actually, uh, sorry, actually Moncalieri, uh, but next to Torino, operated by IREN, utility IREN. And we have uh, at the University of Genoa another uh, validation site for uh, the power-oriented layout. While at KTH, that will be presented later, uh, advanced solutions for thermal energy storage are being investigated theoretically and experimentally. Regarding the University of Genoa uh, validation site, we are demonstrating through the use of uh, a microturbine not represented here, an innovative heat pump with a turbo, turbo expander in place of the lamination valve uh, provided by Mayakawa in the central part of this picture, a thermal energy storage in the back capable of um, 50, oh, sorry, 100 kilowatt hour of cold energy stored and all the pipings required. In the layout you see, basically on the right, the heat pump is connected on the cold side on the thermal energy storage and on both the cold side but potentially also the hot side to the intake of this micro gas turbine which is the Turbec T100 currently produced by Ansad Energia. In this layout we are going to uh, validate at laboratory scale the capabilities of the power oriented layout. So the synergy which is possible between a heat pump producing cold or hot power uh, thermal output with a natural gas turbine. 
uh, the bottom in cycle is not present physically, but will be emulated in cyber physical mode using a bottoming free pressure level model, dynamic model of the steam cycle. At KTH, activities is ongoing regarding the phase change materials, and this will be object of the presentation from my colleague Justin of KTH. Finally, at the Moncalieri combined cycle, um, the Mayekawa large scale uh, heat pump, still not full scale, but relevant scale, uh, 150 kilowatt electricals and more than half megawatt thermals has been shipped and is currently being sold for, together with the um, thermal energy storage, for demonstration of the synergetic operation of a heat pump with a real cogenerative heat pump. Uh, cogenerative combined cycle. Thank you for your time. I leave the Thank word you. back Thank to you. Hugo. Thank you, Alberto. Um, so, uh, if, is there any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, please, you can write in the chat. Otherwise, you will have an opportunity. You can write in the chat, and then at the end of the uh, the webinar, uh, we can post the questions to Alberto. Um, so I would move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is Mr. Justin Ning Wei Chu, Assistant Professor in Renewable Energy at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. KTH is in uh, charge of the development, validation and demonstration of thermal storage materials and most suitable application in the project. So Justin, could you give us more detail on the thermal storage material development in, uh, in pump heat? The floor is yours. Of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Professor Alberto, for the uh, overview of uh, today's uh, session. So my name is Justin. I'm from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, so for the next um, 10 minutes or so, I will present uh, some of the updates and I would say uh, an introduction to uh, the development of thermal energy storage for uh, uh, CCGT uh, applications. So as um, Alberto has presented earlier, um, there are different uh, possibilities of integrating heat pump with storage into a, a combined cycle uh, power plant. Um, what is shown here is the first case where we have the uh, storage integrated to the inlet of the air, um, where we can cool down the inlet air so that we have higher efficiency for compression, um, or we can um, sort of charge our storage. So cool down the storage by heating slightly up the inlet air. So we, we, we lose some efficiency in the compression process, but then we can uh, recharge our cold storage with, a, with the help of a heat pump. So basically we pre-cool the air when uh, we want to have higher efficiency, when the price is good. And then uh, when, when we, don't have so high price, uh, we will use the uh, uh, inlet air uh, as, a, as a heat sink um, where uh, we cool down our storage, so during off-peak periods. Alternatively, so the second uh, parallel operating mode is that we actually use a bit higher temperature. So here we're talking about uh, five degrees Celsius, for instance. And then alternatively, we can uh, have a storage with a heat pump um, either at the uh, condenser side of the um, um, bottoming cycle, or we can have a, a, a storage uh, at the uh, outlet of the flue gas. So we recover some of the flue gas heat. So what are the different options for energy storage? The most common one would be sensible heat storage. So here we put water over here. 
An example of the storage capacity for water is that for, let's say, 85 degrees Celsius of temperature change. So let's say uh, we go from uh, 100 degree, uh, well, slightly below 100 degree uh, liquid water. If we take away the heat, so we cool it down to 15 degrees, so uh, 85 degree Celsius temperature change, we have roughly 100 kilowatt hour per cubic meter of storage capacity. So it's shown here. Um, there are other types of materials, such as phase change materials, PCMs, um, that have gained quite a lot of attention. Uh, re I mean, I would say in the uh, past two decades, um, they have higher storage capacity. So here we see they range from, from let's say, 50 or 60 kilowatt hour per cubic meter up to 200 uh, or so. And the phase change materials, their operating temperature uh, cover a wide range. So in this specific application where we talk about cooling um, of the inlet air or, or uh, for district heat heating, so um, heat recovery with the use of a heat pump, then we are around 100 or so uh, degrees Celsius. We have quite a large range of different materials. So in this project, we have been testing different phase change materials. There is also a thermochemical uh, category where we have actually chemical reactions. This system is, um, I would say, still under uh, research. So at a lower technology readiness level, uh, as it requires a reactor, a chemical reactor. Um, so in this specific project, we are focusing mainly on the phase change material um, which is, uh, I would say, a mature technology, and there are a number of commercial products on the market already. Um, in, at KTH Lab, we are testing different phase change materials for their properties. So to the upper right, you see a climate chamber. Basically here, we control the temperature, we control the humidity, uh, and then we test a bulk size uh, of phase change material. Very often uh, in the lab, we see um, differential scanning calorimetry. This means uh, we are actually testing a very small sample size, uh, like in, in milligram, you can say. Um, and if we want to have the real uh, thermal properties, it is important that we test in terms of uh, tens of grams, so in bulk scale. And this is what we have been doing. Um, so that we get the real uh, thermal properties of our materials. An example is shown here below, uh, where we see there's hysteresis. Uh, so on the y-axis, it's the enthalpy, so it's the storage capacity. On the x-axis, it's the temperature change. Um, and we see that in red, whenever uh, we increase the temperature, uh, we have the first the sensible heat part. And then when it's phase changing, when it's going from liquid, I mean, sorry, from solid to liquid, it's melting, then we have a sharp increase in the enthalpy, but not too much change in the temperature because it's uh, phase changing, it's melting. And then when we go up, it's again sensible heat. And then when we cool it down, we see that the uh, phase change occurs at a lower temperature. This indicates an hysteresis effect. This is Sometimes it is good, especially um, in your hand warmer, if you go hiking, uh, this hysteresis or, or even the super cooling effect, I would say the super cooling effect means that you have to go down well below the freezing temperature before it actually starts to form the crystals, before it starts to freeze. Uh, they are um, beneficial uh, for certain applications. But in our application uh, for this specific project, we try to minimize the supercooling, which is not shown here, and also the hysteresis. So we have been testing different materials, and we uh, went for the one that suits uh, our need the best. To the bottom, you see also um, the um, viscometer, where we measure the viscosity, um, as we want to also um, incorporate uh, convection. Uh, in our heat transfer, in our uh, component design. And to the bottom right over here is shown the, well, this is called TPS. Basically, it's measuring the thermal conductivity. And this is essential 
uh, especially when we're designing for a system that has high enough thermal power, high enough charge rate and high enough discharge rate to suit our demand. And to the left in a beaker over here, you see some emulsified PCM. So basically PCMs in uh, nano encapsulation, small capsules, uh, emulsifier, you can say, uh, that is floating in a liquid. Um, so there are different types of phase change materials. And in this slide, you see we can mainly categorize phase change materials into organic materials and inorganics. We see that the organic materials, they are, how to say, um, lighter in weight, they have lower density, and, and inorganic materials, they have slightly higher density, so they're heavier per liter. Um, so if we're talking about, how to say, um, per weight, um, we, we have higher storage capacity per weight for inorganic materials. And then if we're, um, sorry, how to say, okay, let me reformulate or rephrase it. If we're aiming for uh, a, a small uh, compact size, uh, storage. It's better to go for inorganic materials. If you're aiming for uh, uh, a lighter weight materials um, uh, without conditions on the volume or the space we have, then organic materials are more suitable. There are other aspects to consider, such as the flammability. Organic materials are flammable, while inorganic materials are non-flammable. So for building applications, for applications where um, fire hazard is an issue. Um, there are some considerations. Organic phase change materials, they also have uh, other properties such as self-nucleating. That means we actually have small or even no supercooling effect with organic phase change materials, while for inorganic ones we have larger uh, supercooling effects. So um, there are other types of possible uh, blends or mixtures, such as eutectics. So eutectics, they are known for the properties that they phase change at a sharp point. Um, very often we have a phase change temperature range, while eutectics, they are good because they have a sharp, very sharp one. And of course, there, are, uh, there is the possibility of having uh, powders, uh, granulated materials. We, have, we can have encapsulations, but then of course for those, we lose some of the uh, thermal storage capacity because of the casings, for instance. So here is shown uh, a, a summary of uh, the material in our operating, uh, a list of materials in our operating temperature range. And then when we have decided or determined which materials that is suitable, um, then it comes down to the component design, the heat transfer aspects. Um, there are different types of uh, I would say um, heat exchanger uh, designs that can use. Either we submerge the heat exchanger, such as a thin pipe heat exchanger. We can have a tube uh, type heat exchanger submerged into PCMs, or we can have PCMs inside encapsulation. So bowls, for instance, uh, different torical shaped uh, encapsulations, or even ellipsoidal form shapes. And this we have tested quite a few at KTH lab in the framework of this project where we have coil type so it is shown over here in a 300 uh, liter tank we have the macro encapsulation in the elliptical uh, ellipsoidal uh, shapes and then we also have the slab type of storage encapsulations we did the performance testing so here to the right, I'm showing just one of the many graphs and many uh, characteristics we have uh, tested. Here in blue, um, uh, you can see the power uh, that we can extract from our storage. And then the temperature at the outlet is shown in yellow over here. And we see that there is actually a plateau. So at the beginning, it's increasing, increasing, and then it stops increasing um, following the same slope, but it slows down. Uh, because the temperature sort of reaches a plateau, this is where we have the phase change. So in this specific case, we're testing a material that has a phase change temperature range between 60 to 65. Hence this uh, plateau over here. Once it's fully charged or discharged, depending on your application, we see that it starts to increase again. 
So uh, with that, I would like to end my short presentation, which is an introduction to what we are doing in the work package three of the Pump Heat Horizon 2020 project. And um, we have just had a good piece of news that is uh, the demonstration uh, unit has been successfully installed at the power plants um, in Italy, Moncalieri. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Back to you, you go. Thank you very much, Justin. Very interesting. Do we have any question for uh, Justin? Or as usual, I see one for Alberto that we will take at the end of the, all the presentations. So you can uh, also write a question for Justin if you want, and then we will uh, uh, post the question at the end. So let's move on to the next presenter, um, Mr. Stefano Piola, Performance and Operations Team Leader at Ansaldo Energia. Ansaldo Energia is a leading provider of gas turbine worldwide, and uh, they are in charge for the definition of the requirements for the pump heat combined cycle replication. Stefano is going to give us a technology manufacturer's perspective on the challenges for the integration of heat pumps in the combined cycle gas turbine power plant cycles. Stefano, the, the floor is yours. Uh, you have, you are muted. Okay, now I am. Thanks. Thank you, Hugo. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to the main challenges uh, uh, of the integration of the heat pumps into the combined cycle power plant cycles. Um, so I will. This is my this is my summary, the summary of the presentation. We will um, make a, a quick introduction of the main challenge of the pump concept. And then we will split the discussion into two, two main uh, um, items. One is uh, dedicated to the power-oriented uh, combined cycle, and the other one is uh, dedicated to the combined heat and power uh, plants, uh, as explained by Alberto in the, in the first presentation. So um, going to the main challenge part, uh, I would say that we already know that nowadays uh, combined cycle gas turbines um, are facing a highly demanding efficiency and flexibility requirements. Huh? And uh, often, uh, also now, they are not profitable enough to avoid closure or uh, stopping, or balling, or uh, these uh, uh, this kind of situations. Um, the pump heat integration concept in these uh, combined cycle power plants uh, is intended to be an opportunity uh, to make uh, the combined cycle, the gas turbine technology, a kind of a bridge, a bridging technology to a de decarbonized economy. And uh, especially when we think about uh, the flexible, the, sorry, the um, renewable uh, generation that we is growing and growing, uh, it will grow uh, further in the future. Um, to do that, I mean, to be a real uh, bridging technology, of course, it must win uh, the main challenges that are uh, described in, uh, in the ballots. Eh? So uh, the, um, the pump heat integration uh, for sure must uh, enhance uh, increase the plant flexibility, uh, since uh, we said that uh, the power plants will be required to run in a flexible way uh, already now, but more and more in the future, and to increase uh, the overall efficiency. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the pump it concept must be techno-thermo economically viable uh, compared to the already uh, known solutions and, uh, let's say, the, uh, the solutions that are uh, already applied by uh, operators. So, uh, as I said, we will focus first on this uh, power only, uh, plants and secondly we will talk about uh, uh, how is the integration of the, of the heat pump inside a more complex combined heat and power uh, power plant. Um, I think I can go to the power oriented uh, power plants. Um, so um, we 
we I said that uh, uh, it must be, of course, technically feasible, the solution, uh, and thermoeconomically viable. To be um, technically feasible, uh, I identified uh, these uh, main three, um, say, items uh, as challenges uh, to be technically feasible. The first uh, is uh, inside the pump, the pump, uh, the heat pump uh, uh, technology itself, eh? uh, because we need for uh, advanced technology heat pump, because we need uh, for a high uh, COP. COP is the coefficient of performance of the heat pump. It's a kind of efficiency measure, performance measure of the heat pump. We need to 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 keep high uh, coefficient of performance uh, in order to be, uh, let's say, to, to give a benefit in the overall uh, efficiency uh, of this concept. To do that, uh, uh, Mayakawa uh, is uh, say thinking, is taking care of the design of this butane-based uh, uh, heat pump. Uh, so it will use uh, butane as a working medi uh, media. Uh, the problem is the, the challenge is that the, the butane is a flammable uh, fluid, and uh, say it, it uh, all the, the the typical challenges with flammable uh, components inside the power plant must be taken into consideration. So all the attacks zoning and um, the the let's say the aspect related to the to the flammable uh, problem. Um, anyway, the, the preliminary studied, studies demonstrates that uh, butane, um, say the pressure and the temperature fall within uh, the design of the compressor of the, of the heat pump. And uh, yeah, so this uh, is uh, the first point that I would mention as a, uh, a challenge to keep the technical feasibility of this uh, integration. The second one is uh, about the thermal energy storage, as uh, described before by Justin. Um, this is very important because the studies uh, that uh, this uh, pump it project uh, recently did demonstrate how this uh, uh, thermal energy storage is the, is the key enabler for the successful integration of the heat pump inside the, the combined cycle power plants. Uh, it must be, um, let's say, uh, studied uh, sites, technology and the costs of this, uh, uh, of this equipment. And uh, we have to uh, properly uh, know um, charging and discharging uh, characteristics, uh, intermediate charging and discharging characteristics, intermittent uh, way of, uh, of working of these devices. Um, the third point uh, is about uh, the uh, plant operation scheduler. Uh, um, this is a must to properly manage the operation modes in a such complex system uh, which includes uh, heat pumps, uh, thermal energy storages. Uh, it, it must manage the continuous cooling or heating, the, the charging or discharging of the thermal energy stor storage together with the today's and future complex ma market scenario. So uh, we have to, let's say, uh, to leave uh, the uh, classic uh, way of uh, like logic, uh, logical predefined controller of the, of the power plant, uh, but uh, and we have to, to think of uh, uh, something more complex, which includes an, an optimization strategy, which takes into account several uh, degrees of freedom and several uh, objective functions. Um, to be thermoeconomically viable, uh, um, we, it is uh, demonstrated by the recent studies in this project that uh, it's important to uh, be able to um, uh, increase the profitability from the ancillary service market. And this can be done by uh, reducing, for example, the minimum environmental load, which, uh, avoids, uh, which uh, allows us to avoid uh, unwanted shutdowns of the power plant as to say increase the probability that the, the power plant is uh, uh, is called for these uh, uh, service ancillary services mm -hmm. uh, the point here uh, for the challenge is that this uh, market is highly unpredictable so also uh, from a term economical analysis point of view is uh, uh, a challenge itself to um, to make a kind of uh, anal term economic analysis, including uh, the ancillary service market due to the unpredictability of this uh, uh, environment. 
Um, another uh, important point to be um, thermoeconomically viable is that the solution must reduce the emissions and uh, the uh, operation and maintenance costs. Uh, for sure, the reduction of the intraday shutdown and startup is uh, a, a key enabler for the reduced emission. Um, in fact, if we compare uh, a hot pressurized startup, it has a cost of around 24,000 uh, euros and uh, uh, more, uh, with more than 100 tons of CO2 emitted. And this can be uh, with the solution, uh, the pump pit concept can be economically replaced with a, a turn down period if we are able to keep the, the minimum environmental load sufficiently low, uh, let's say, and affordable. Um, on the operation and maintenance cost, uh, the, the point is that uh, avoiding the, the shutdown and startup, uh, we reduce uh, the, um, a significant part of the component's life consumption. Um, in the next slide, I would like to uh, go a little bit more in deep in the, uh, um, the way in which the minimum environmental load is, can be reduced by the heat pump concept. Um, and how this enhances the profit profitability of the power plant. Uh, we said that uh, the, the main, uh, the key enabler is that we need to remain available uh, for uh, longer periods for the ancillary service market. And um, in the example that is shown in the table, we have a, a typical case of combined cycle sites of around 400 megawatts, uh, which has been studied in, uh, inside the uh, pump it project. And we, are, uh, we take into consideration a, a variation of uh, 30 degrees in the uh, compressor inlet temperature, um, for example, between 15 and 45 uh, degrees. Um, the first, uh, we have uh, different solutions to achieve a minimal, uh, sorry, to achieve an um, increase of the inlet temperature. Uh, the first one is an ideal case. Uh, we call it for free because uh, um, we have we let's say we we take uh, we don't pay for the for the heat that we uh, use to increase the inlet temperature so it's just ideal in that case uh, the uh, the power of the power plant will be uh, 30 around 30 megawatts lower than the standard uh, MEL uh, with a decrease in efficiency of uh, about uh, 0 0.8 point percent the second case is where is the, the commonly used solution uh, for the operators, uh, some of them at least, they use the heat uh, from the water sink cycle. So from the bottoming cycle, uh, a part of this uh, heat is taken and uh, is used to uh, heat up the gas turbine inlet. In that case, we have a, a negative effect Negative depends on the point of view, but uh, it reducing effect of the electrical production uh, from the steam uh, from the steam cycle. Uh, so the the minimum uh, minimum environmental load is uh, further further reduced to 32 megawatts. Uh, the efficiency decreases to uh, minus 1.3 points compared to the standard MEL solution. Uh, if we uh, then in the in the last two uh, we have the 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 heat pump uh, solutions, uh, we see that uh, uh, both uh, with no tests and with uh, tests uh, uh, charging and discharging, we, uh, we drop the, the minimum load uh, furtherly due to the electrical consumption uh, of the heat pump itself, uh, which acts as a, an electrical load. Mm. Uh, of course, we also avoid emission, as I said, of the startup and uh, the component aging. Uh, um, if you look in the table, then you can see that uh, each avoided startup and shutdowns uh, um, is about 98 tons of CO2 and 70, 70, um, sorry, 67 kilo, kilograms of NOx. Mm -hmm. So, uh, going to the combined heat and power plant, which is a, a little bit more complex, we have to split uh, retrofit and new unit solutions for the retrofit application. Yeah. Stefano, can I ask you to summarize? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
we have some challenges to overcome in the retrofit application uh, because of the, the steam flow that uh, cannot be reduced too much on the bottoming cycle by extracting it to, to feed the heat pump cycle. Uh, and also the minimum exhaust temperature of the stack has to keep uh, to be kept sufficiently high to keep the buoyancy effect. Uh, nonetheless, in the new units, uh, uh, we have uh, the, um, let's say, the best performance achieved with the flue gas condensation does, uh, uh, let's say, all uh, uh, the challenges relate to the um, uh, to the, the condensation of corrosion uh, and corrosion issues uh, must be taken into account while designing the equipment, uh, and this uh, imposes a particular layout. Even because uh, we have to then, after the condensation of the flue gas, we have to reheat the flue gas in order to keep such uh, the, the sufficient temperature for the buoyancy effect at the exhaust. Um, in this case, uh, the key enabler is the uncoupling between the GT load uh, and the thermal energy production. Um, I think I go to the next, which uh, is, uh, the, I think, the most interesting one. We have here the iron diagram, uh, which is uh, the space in which the typical combined unit power plant uh, operates, so thermal power and electrical power. On the left, uh, there is uh, the heat pump solution. On the right, there is the uh, additional uh, heat-only boiler solution. So it, in case we want to extend uh, the thermal power the same range as we can do with, a, a, um, let's say, a non-solution, the heat-only boiler, we can see in the left that we can do it uncoupling the electrical production to the thermal power production. Eh? And this is a key enabler for, the, uh, for this uh, kind of integration. Uh, for example, you see that you can reduce the electrical power here due to the extended range allowed by the heat pump integration, keeping the same thermal power production. Or more interestingly, you can increase the, the thermal power production while keeping the same fuel. This you cannot for sure do uh, with the heat only boiler because an increase of thermal power would mean an increase of uh, fuel mass flow. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this, I think I am already out of time and uh, I would like to thank you. These are some, you can find here some references of uh, the heat pump project and specifically of what I presented. And uh, yeah, thank you all. And I will leave the word to Hugo for questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stefano. Very nice presentation. Uh, we, we will uh, anyway upload uh, uh, the recordings of this uh, um, webinar on our YouTube channels. So uh, just as a reminder, is there any question? Or uh, Stefano, just a clarification question. Okay, then uh, uh, I would move to our uh, last speaker, um, Mr. Adrian Rebeyer from uh, Product Manager from uh, Siemens uh, Digital. Adrian, could you tell us something more about the challenges related to the control uh, uh, for the flexibility of uh, power plants? Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Adrien Réveillet. I'm working for uh, Siemens Digital Industries in France. I'm going to share some challenges that we faced uh, in the work package four of the Pumpit project dedicated to, um, to the control system of the heat pump and more specifically to a model predictive control that involves a digital twin. So a digital twin is something that we hear a lot about these days. And let me firstly uh, put some rough definition that comes from the literature on it. A uh, digital twin is a dynamic virtual representation of the physical object or a system across its life cycle using real-time data to enable understanding, learning, and reasoning. <laughs> You hear a lot of uh, information and usage uh, for a digital twin, and this is uh, the best definition that I could find uh, in, in the literature. Uh, so this digital twin for the heat pump, in our case, uh, will be a system dynamic model for the heat pump developed with the SimCenter AIMSIM uh, software. This is a 1D simulation tool. 
And the, we use different libraries uh, that refers to the different uh, physics uh, inside the system, meaning uh, thermal domain, thermal hydraulic, uh, two-phase flow, of course, for the betaine heat pump, and also some signal library for control purposes. Uh, this digital twin that we do, we'll use it for uh, several, um, several objectives. The first one is concept validation, very early in the design phase, um, with just uh, uh, a quick model from the uh, nominal operating point. We can um, easily uh, validate uh, the concept of the product. And later on, of course, within the work package, we use it for control system validation, but also for uh, embedding um, the, the, the model part, the predictivity part in an MPC control system. A G digital twin can have various, I would say, maturity uh, that refers to uh, the design cycle of, uh, of a product, in this case, the heat pump. In the pre-design phase, you can have just little information with one operating point. Then you have the design phase we, where you can have some uh, su subsystem data sheets from supplier for calibration. Then you have the test phase with transient test results for calibration and of course operational phase. Each, each uh, of these phase correspond to an, a different maturity level of the model. That's what I call it. And uh, it also corresponds to different level of information that you can have and inject within the digital twin. Uh, if we have a look more deeply on um, this digital twin made uh, with SimCenter AIMSIM, uh, you can see here uh, screenshots of uh, the model. You can have, you have uh, at the top the district heating network, which we are trying to heat up an intermediate loop, the butane, butane heat pump uh, in red, and finally the plant steam loop. Of course, we are focusing here on the heat pump loop, and this is the control system of this uh, heat pump that uh, we are uh, spending uh, quite a lot of effort on. Uh, from this uh, kind of model, we can, of course, derive some dynamic results like uh, pH diagram, also TS diagrams. And, uh, of course, we can have also several uh, post-processing. Um, this is the, an example of the validation for the linear model, because within this model predictive control, the predictivity is ensured by uh, the, this digital twin, which is linearized. So we went through a linearization process, and once this is done, we validated the linear model against the nonlinear model. And this is exactly the processing that you can see uh, with the linear model that is in red and the nonlinear model that is in blue. Let's move on now to the integration of the model uh, within the uh, model predictive control. I told you uh, first we need this AMSIM model for the heat pump, uh, this butane heat pump, and of course this uh, model is validated and gets uh, supplier data. In this case, uh, the heat pump is manufactured by the partner Mayakawa, so we worked of course closely with Mayakawa to make sure that uh, the digital twin uh, is uh, completely uh, faithful with the reality. Uh, uh, we, from this model, we derive a linear model. Uh, this is, uh, so, so we create a, a state space representation of the model. Um, this is valid only around the operating point that was used uh, in the linearization process. And this uh, state space is injected in the model predictive control algorithm in made in Simulink, and this model predictive control will call the model every second to predict the system response and adapt the command. Finally, once this is done, we have to validate our control system. And to do so, we actually reuse um, the digital twin and co-simulate with um, the control system uh, made in, uh, in Simulink. That means the digital twin is now acting as a virtual plant to make sure that the control system behaves accordingly. That's the 
for my uh, presentation. I will give uh, back the floor uh, to Ugo Simeone. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks a lot. Do we have any uh, question for uh, Adrian? Okay, so you can uh, write in the chat. In the meantime, I can take the question that was uh, um, asked by Peter uh, Janssen to Alberto Traverso. Uh, have you checked roughly the dynamic operational characteristics of the different components in the various concepts? Heat pump versus uh, uh, CCPT uh, examples in terms of load ramps. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for this question. Um, well, of course, there is a, a steady state analysis where the colleagues, uh, especially Stefano, showed the, the, the results. Uh, and there is all, all the dynamic part uh, and controls, which has been outlined. Uh, time is not, uh, is not enough, but just outlined by Adrian. So I would say that from a steady, we know that from a steady state point of view, this system is very promising. Uh, we can have significant extension of the range of operation which means that theoretically we can increase significantly the power range. We're talking about, uh, you know, I'm just 10, 10 15, 20% of overall ramps that can be done. Um, how to do it? There are bottlenecks. The dynamic simulation helps to understand where dynamic, where bottlenecks are present. And just to say one example, in our lab, we are now facing the bottleneck of the heat pump because also the, the heat pump is like the combined cycle 20 years ago. They like to work steady state, base load. So to make this system being flexible to uh, be coordinated with combined cycle is a challenge, nothing special, but there are some little tuning to be done. Thanks a lot, Alberto. I to me, it was clear. I believe that uh, this was the same. I don't know whether there is any other uh, question. Or you can raise your hand. Otherwise, I would. Uh, otherwise, well, I, I don't see any question. Uh, other than I would, yes, indeed, uh, thank all the speakers that join this uh, webinar and also the, the participants. If you have any additional question, you can always contact uh, uh, the ETN Global Secretariat and we will uh, uh, forward it to the presenter. Um, so th thank you everyone and um, for, for joining and participating. And I will wait for you to the next episode of the uh, ETN webinar uh, series, uh, uh, which will uh, feature the uh, other Horizon 2020 project, the, the supercritical the SO2 flex, focusing on uh, supercritical uh, CO2 uh, power plants in, uh, uh, in combined cycles. So the, the link has just been put by my colleague uh, Elisa on, uh, in the chat box. Thanks a lot, everyone, and have a nice uh, uh, afternoon. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye, then. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.